anyway, I think it, it is an excellent paper and I think it's important that people like us and other people hopefully dissect the paper because it's quite dense technically so that the general public, so that people can really understand you know, what it's driving at. And it's very, very important. I mean, the greenhouse gases today, if we just, if they stayed where they are today, we're gonna have 10 degrees Celsius warming in the long term. Welcome to the Climate Emergency Forum. We're glad to have you with us here today. And let me just mention that as we tape right now, May 24th, the majority of Guam is left without power as a massive storm, a storm called Mawar, just pummeled the island relentlessly. This is what we've been hearing about, the increasing power of storms, and we are seeing the increasing detriment, especially to small island nations. Also, as we come to you, another report has just been released that were power to be lost in certain parts of the southwestern states of America, thousands of people would perish. So you see the reality of this climate catastrophe has come home to roost. So with that cheery news, we have a paper that's just been released uh, with lead scientist James Hansen, Global Warming and the Pipeline. When the Climate Emergency Forum was in Glasgow for COP26, one of the big taglines that we saw in beautiful posters all over the city was, keep 1.5 alive. And we knew, as you surely know, that that was just really just a pipe dream. Perhaps it could have been true, but with this paper, we know now, and we have known to be honest, but when James Hansen says it, you have to acknowledge that 1.5 is not only not alive, it's dead in the well. So we're gonna bring this paper to you today. It's a draft paper from Dr. James Hansen. And I wanna start with Peter, because Peter, your relentless drumbeat has been 1.5 is a lie. So I want to hear what you thought about this paper. Did it verify everything that you've been telling us all along? In addition to that, Peter, uh, I would like to know if you learned anything new from this paper. It's a long paper. And for most people, it would be very difficult to read. Um, it's interesting to us because he sort of goes over the history of uh, climate change and climate change science. It's quite a trip to wade through it. But the most important thing to me in the paper is that James Hansen gives the lie to 1.5 degrees C being still alive and to 2 degrees C being possible. This is not you. He's, he said it in his uh, newsletters in no uncertain terms. Um, but it's good to see it in this paper because I think actually, although there's a ton of science in the paper, this really is the most important thing. The scientific community is intent on continuing to uh, mislead us down the garden path. God knows why. Um, they are still saying that we can uh, achieve 1.5 degrees C, which is absolutely absurd. If they've even said this with the recent release from the WMO of the fact that we will have 1.5 degrees C for at least one year over the next five years. But you know what they say? They said at the same time, they stressed the fact that, oh, this doesn't mean that we are actually at 1.5 degrees C. Oh, no, 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 it may come back down again. But of course, it's impossible because the key characteristic of climate change known for decades has always been inertia and momentum. The great inertia and momentum of the climate system and that means that as the 1990 IPCC first ever report said that we are committed to a significantly more warming at any particular time. They got it to 0.9 degrees C in 1990, which I thought was pretty interesting because um, in uh, 2007 it was put at 0.6 degrees C. 
Now, now, James Hansen is the exception again, of course. He has always stressed climate change commitment. And for many, many, many years, he's called it warming in the pipeline. What he said on that is that it's at least another 0.6 by 2100. And it, he he figures, and I'm sure he's probably an underestimate, let alone right, that uh, it's another one point, it's another 0 0.6 because of the technological scientific inertia, right? So we are at two degrees C already. And he refers to this, which um, which I noticed and was very interested in. He refers to this from his calculation of radiative forcing and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which makes us way beyond two degrees C. So we are, as James Hansen has said, actually, he said, two degrees C is baked in, guys. He's used that term, and that's right. But he's a voice crying in the climate wilderness yet again, you know, as he always seems to have been all his life, because, again, the scientific community is not agreeing with him. They continue to contradict him, which I think is absolutely deplorable and unconscionable at the situation we're in with respect to the dire climate change emergency. So the paper, of course, uh, gets immediate attention because right up there up front in the abstract, he says warming in the pipeline is 10 degrees C. So, of course, that would be shocking to anybody and everybody. But there's a good reason for that. And he referred to the reason, which is ice sheet albedo feedback. In his 2008 CO2 paper, target CO2, you remember, that was a big 350 paper. He introduced the idea at that time, which was agreed to by many scientists at the time, of the slow feedbacks which would double the equilibrium uh, temperature increase because it would double the climate sensitivity. So instead of the climate sensitivity being three degrees C, at that time, he said it's six degrees C. So we had to keep um, atmospheric greenhouse gases to 350. And of course, now we're at, we're at 420. So everybody, of course, has always for years, you know, been very concerned, made a lot out of the sea level rise on the ice sheets. But the big impact of the ice sheets is albedo. And he really goes to town in this paper on that. And that's how he and his team get to 10 degrees C. He, always, he also mentions, which is interesting to me, that he thinks that feedback from uh, wetlands will be inevitable. Well, it is inevitable because it's happening, right? We've got methane feedback from warming of the uh, wetlands in the tropics and the subarctics. So it's a terribly important paper, number one, I think, because it tells the lie of the 1.5 degrees C, which, as I say, is absurd. And it's a very important paper because it points out that the, the big fear of ice sheets is not sea level rise. It's a huge, huge amplifying feedback. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter, for pointing that out. It's really, really true. The sea level rise is sort of like the sexy topic in the room. And I know for me, that has always been something I've focused on. But it is truly terrifying, this amplifying feedback of albedo loss. My gosh, that's really going to be just incredible. And, you know, I just read that for every 0.1 degree Celsius of warming, 150 million people are exposed to dangerously high levels of heat. So it's just so, so destabilizing in just so many ways. And Paul, I wanna to turn to you because as Peter said, there's a lot of science in this paper. Uh, it would be very heavy for many people to digest. I think Peter did a fantastic job of really speaking to it and making it something we can understand. And I'd like to hear some of your takeaways from the paper. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, a little history on the paper. So the original draft, I think it came out in um, early January of this year or maybe late December of last year. And it was 48 pages. So quite lengthy, as Peter has said. And just um, last week, so May 19th, I believe, a new draft came out of the paper, a revised version, which is about 62 pages or something like that. So is even more involved. So there's lots of um, calculations and lots of science in, in these papers. But basically, uh, the gist of it is that the global climate models, the GCMs, or you can say AOGCMs, Atmosphere Ocean Global Climate Models, those models have always been under predicting you know, rates of change. They've been too conservative. And the better way to go is to 
get uh, numbers like equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is how much the climate warms for a doubling of CO2 levels and things like that, we can arrive at much more accurate, realistic numbers, not from the GCM, the models, but from paleoclimate data. So looking at by paleoclimate data, I, I mean, how do we get information on temperature and levels of greenhouse gases in the past? It depends on the time scale, but let's start with tree rings. We can count tree rings and go back to the lifetime of a, a given tree and then match the rings that we see to previous dead trees. And some trees live for thousands of years. So we can go back a few thousands of years with that. If we want to go back further, we look at the ice cores, of course. The ice cores on Greenland, we can go back 150,000 years, 200,000 years. If we go to the thicker ice on Antarctica, we can drill the cores and uh, they go back to about 800, 900,000 years. There's some cores that they're working on that might go back a million years. And from isotopes, et cetera, we can extract greenhouse gas levels going back in time, but also global temperatures. And then when we go back further than that, we need to look at uh, marine sediment cores. So cores of taken, drill cores of ocean sediments, and from then we can go back, you know, millions and upon millions of years, also from things like stalactites and stalagmites in caves, et cetera. Now, of course, uh, with these methods, as we go back in time, the resolution is less. So we don't know as accurately from year to year. By resolution, I mean time resolution. The tree rings, we can tell every year. You know, we go to the ice cores, you know, every tens of years or 50 years, and then the marine sediments, the resolution is less. So that's the gist of it. So knowing the temperature changes and the greenhouse gas levels, say 20,000 years ago at the peak of the, of the last glacial maximum, when the ice was thickest, gives us good numbers. We can go back to the the Paleo-Eocene thermal maximum, a very warm time on Earth to know the CO2 levels, et cetera. So from all of this data, we can get a better idea of the equilibrium climate sensitivity, which Hansen reports on. So he talks about the equilibrium climate sensitivity, both, both based on fast feedbacks and slow feedbacks, and then something called ultra-fast feedbacks. So slow feedbacks are the ice sheets changing maybe vegetation cover, atmospheric CO2. The fast feedbacks are things like water vapor, clouds, sea ice is very fast. And then ultra fast is to do with the earth energy imbalance. When that changes, we can get ultra fast changes in the climate system. For example, in stratospheric warming and cooling, that can happen very fast. So the bottom line is that to, with today's greenhouse gas forcing, and the best science from these paleo studies, today's greenhouse gas forcing is 4.1 watts per square meter. And if you multiply that by about 2.5 or 2.4 degrees Celsius per watt per square meter, th that ratio, we get that 10 degrees Celsius locked in in the pipeline for today's greenhouse gas levels. That's with fast and slow feedback aerosols reduce that to about eight degrees Celsius. So the warming from 1970 to 2010 was about 0 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. Beyond 2010, with the reduction of aerosols, it's gonna be more like 0 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade. So, you know, we're gonna blow past 1.5 Celsius within the next few years, especially with the power fill El Nino. And we're gonna blow through two degrees Celsius shortly after that because the, the everything's accelerating. Yeah, I mean, that's the bottom line. The climate models need to use the paleo climate information to get a better handle on what's happening, you know, why climate change is so abrupt. Thank you so much, Paul, for breaking down those, those the slow and the fast and the super fast. Again, that's something I can really grab onto and understand exactly what you're talking about I feel like that's one of the benefits of the Climate Emergency Forum. And if you have been watching this and you've learned a thing or two, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, it really helps with the algorithm. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. We'd love to have you aboard. As I mentioned, we are going to make this paper available. It is an academic paper freely available to the public. Well, we'd like for you to take a look at it. And if you have anything to share with us, 
please put your thoughts in the comments and add to the conversation. And in terms of conversation, I just want to add one thing that I think really helps bring this down to brass tacks. And I'm, I'm going to bring it to the human level. It's not my favorite thing, but the number of people exposed to dangerous heat by 2070 in India alone, it'll be over 600 million, Nigeria, over 300 million, and Indonesia, almost 100 million people. Now, where are those people going to go? In India, they can go to northern India, maybe. And of course, that's going to cause problems because there's already problems in the Kashmir region. But places such as Burkina Faso, where are they going to go? Because you know what? 100% of their country is going to be exposed to dangerous heat levels by 2070. Also, Mali and also Qatar or Qatar. I'm never sure how to pronounce it. But when you have an entire country, the whole entire country, 100% is exposed to dangerous heat levels, you're going to have many, many, many people moving because the country is no longer inhabitable. And again, I've said it before, it's terribly, terribly frightening because these things, this is, these are implications for geopolitical chaos. Now, I want to turn it back to my friend Peter and hear more of what he has to share. Peter? Well, yeah, that's a very, very important paper. And um, uh, I'm glad you brought it up. And it, it's certainly one that deserves further discussion. So uh, just a couple of things on uh, climate sensitivity. James Hansen and his colleagues, um, using paleoclimate data as well, as Paul says, um, gets it to 4 degrees C for double CO2. Now, it's been 3 degrees C ever since 1990. But in fact, the latest CMIP6 models that were covered in the uh, long part of the IPCC6 assessment, they get climate sensitivity to 3.75 degrees C. So 4 degrees C isn't, isn't uh, far off that at all. But IPCC, and God knows why, they looked at the 3.75 and they said, oh, well, we'll just keep it to 3 degrees C, which again is an absurdity, you know. So that's really important. The four degree C is a huge, huge difference from three degree C, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you know, I, th I think I think that's the uh, main thing uh, that I, that I wanted to discuss. discuss. Although one little tiny bit, I said that James Hansen goes into history, so he goes right back to the 1980s, where I presume he was in the room because it was I can't remember where it was. It was one of those um, uh, science centers, the United States has had forever. And there was an Exxon scientist there, and the Exxon scientist said, well, you know, the thing that we really need to worry about, the thing that could be really bad is the feedbacks. 1980s, Exxon knew the dangers, the catastrophic dangers of climate system feedbacks. And they are enormous. And they've started already with the dreaded methane feedbacks coming from warming wetlands. The scientists should be all over this. They're not. You know, if you spend the time like Paul and I and other people do, then, you, you know, you can find what they're saying. And they're saying, um, you and Nesbitt, for example, said you're very definite, very definite, the feedbacks, the 80% uh, of the recent explosive increase in atmospheric methane is feedbacks. And as he said, that's worrying because it's uncontrollable. My last comment is that I have a big disappointment in the James Hansen paper, and it's a big disappointment that I have in all the scientists. They do not repeat the strong recommendation of the sixth assessment of the IPCC that global emissions must go into decline rapidly, quote, immediately. There's nothing more important ever probably to human history or the history of life on this planet, than that finding by the IPCC, which is all through the mitigation third assessment and was stated emphatically at the Glasgow Climate Conference, for example, that we've already mentioned. So that's my disappointment. I think the scientists have to get on track here. Thank you so much, Peter. And I know that's the one thing that you always emphasize, no more burning of fossil fuels and I totally agree with you. There's no other solution. But we have a society that's asleep at the wheel. 
Paul, what are your concluding thoughts on the paper? Again, it's a very technical paper, and I'm going to have a series of videos on my own channel getting into the details of the technical nature of it, but a couple other comments. James Hansen's also working on a book right now called Sophie's Planet, and I'm sure that his publisher is, is starting to tighten the thumbscrews and, you know, you know, say, when am I going to get the book? Because it's supposed, you know, the publication date is supposed to be now, essentially, but it keeps slipping. But I can see why, because of the length of the papers that Hansen is producing. There's so much, you know, he's so detailed, covers so many different aspects. And, you know, like I said, the revision, even the revision, 48 pa pages was enough, but the revision added another, you know, dozen, four, another 14 pages or so to it. And I want to point out that uh, he's working on another paper. I think the title will be Global Sea Level in the Pipeline. And I think I have a bit of an idea of what he's going to be talking about, because he's the one that has said, you know, he's adamantly said we can expect five meters of global sea level rise by 2100. You know, and that's 10 times higher than what the IPCC people were saying. I mean, now other scientists and stuff are talking about a few meters by then. But I think we're going to get a lot of surprises on sea level rise um, in that paper that comes out. And then hopefully after that, Sophie's Planet comes out. And, you know, I loved his book, Dorms of, of Our Grandchildren from Hansen. That was a classic book. And I think that uh, his next book will be just as good. Getting back to uh, some of the conclusions of the paper, you know, and you can read it in the, like I always say, read the abstract, read the summary, read, you know, look at the figures of the paper if you want to get a good understanding uh, without going into all of the details. And some of his conclusions are that we need to, we need a, an increasing price on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is very important. He should probably come out and say directly why. I mean, we, we have to zero fossil fuel emissions. Uh, he also talked about needing global cooperation, east-west cooperation to get that done. I think he's thinking of the, you know, the, the, the war. But he's also saying we need to intervene with the radiative energy imbalance and what he's talking about is things like carbon dioxide removal, and he's talking about solar radiation management. So he's on board with those things, saying that this is an emergency. We need to take action on these. Anyway, I think it, it is an excellent paper, and I think it's important that people like us and other people hopefully dissect the paper because it's quite dense technically so that the general public, so that people can really understand you know, what it's driving at. And it's very, very important. I mean, the greenhouse gases today, if we just, if they stayed where they are today, we're going to have 10 degrees Celsius warming in the long term. And half of that in sort of the, the mid midterm, if you like. The numbers like 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade multiplied by the number of decades. And you can figure, you can just calculate yourself where we're rapidly heading with all of these fast feedbacks Flow feedbacks and ultra fast feedback. So it's a it's a it's a key paper for sure. Thank you so much for that, Paul. And I have to say that what you said was very, very important. Yes, it's a technical paper, and it's so important that this is what we try to do with the climate emergency form. Make the science easy to understand. The scientists, such as James Hansen, they focus on the science. It's it's not so much a, a narrative thing that they're involved in, but we try to, to allow some narration so that it's easier for everyone to understand. You don't have to have a, a PhD in, in science. And, and I think that this topic is so important that everyone should have access to understanding the science of climate change. As I said, the paper is free freely available. We can put the link in the description. We would love to hear your thoughts. And in terms of thoughts, our thoughts, of course, are with those who have suffered in massive flooding in Italy. And of course, those who are now suffering as we tape in Guam. Um, this is going to continue and our hearts go out to them. And we thank you so much for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you next time the Climate Emergency Forum.